scripture passages, which when they come around in the lectionary cycle that I tend to preach from, often compel pastors to let out an exaggerated sigh. It compels us to wonder aloud with one another whether we've chosen the right profession and what good news we could possibly squeeze out of this very dry stone. Today's passage is one of these, not because it's an especially tricky teaching, but because it is so well known. Indeed, most of you have parts of it or similar translations thereof memorized down to the very pauses where we all stop to take a breath. Nearly every week in church, we recite some of these verses. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy words, but words we know so innately that we can see this passage and think, oh, okay, it's the Lord's Prayer again. Here we go. And unless I want to spend 15 minutes on a discursus regarding whether debts, trespasses, or sins is the best translation of the Lord's Prayer, which I really don't, uh, it bears wondering, okay, what else might we have to learn from this holy prayer? To start us off this morning, I'd like to share with all of you a story from my relatively recent past, which hopefully will shed some light on our passage for today. My family and I moved to Connecticut from Massachusetts just over five years ago. As most of you know, my older son, Zach, has high-functioning autism and ADHD, and in order to afford his very expensive therapy-based preschool back then, we had a total of three health insurance policies set up for him in Massachusetts. This was not at all complicated, I assure you. And when we realized we were moving, I called to cancel some of these Massachusetts-based policies. Unfortunately, one of the companies put the end date into their computer system. They put it in incorrectly. Instead of saying that his policy would go through the end of February, they instead put the cancellation date as being at the end of January. It was a simple keystroke error. It was innocently done, I fully believe. But getting his coverage reinstated for that month was hardly simple and hardly innocent. For months, I called their customer service department. I would share what had happened with the poor representative on the other end of the line. Usually I was told that this is an easy fix, no problem. I'd hear some click, click, clicks of their keyboard and was informed that in five to 10 business days, the matter should be resolved. So I would wait the two weeks and then I'd call again, only to be told that the end date for my son's policy was still listed at the end of January, not February. Click, 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 all should be solved now, ma'am. Sorry for the inconvenience. And two weeks later, I call again and find myself in what felt like an unfunny adaptation of the movie Groundhog Day, where I'd have to reiterate literally verbatim every single thing I had articulated two weeks prior. It was like wash, rinse, repeat. This two-week cycle indeed became part of my routine as much as doing the laundry or cleaning the house. And every two weeks, as more and more letters threatening to seize our tax refunds, to pay these uncovered medical expenses would arrive in our mail, I found myself getting shorter and shorter with the poor folks on the other end of the line at the company, most of whom, again, I truly believe were actually trying to help. Finally, my annoyance compelled me to speak to a supervisor who at first actually refused to talk to me. <laughs> okay. Had I reflected on our passage back then, it might very well have felt like a cruel joke. I can laugh about it now, but five years ago, things were very different. Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. Jesus is telling here the story of a man who finds himself with an unexpected visitor in the middle of the night. Not enough food in the house to offer him a meal, as was expected in the codes of hospitality in Jesus' day. As also would have been customary, the friend goes to a neighbor in the middle of the night and says, hey, I know you're already in bed, but I need some help. The neighbor refuses at first, but then eventually does get up to help his friend. But he does so for two reasons, according to Jesus. He is his friend, 
but more, the friend is persistent in asking, basically bugging the guy into helping him. I invite you to hold on to those key points for just a moment. This is a friend, and the friend is persistent. Back to my insurance woes. The day after speaking to the supervisor, I received a call from another representative who informed me that my claim had been denied. What claim? I asked the poor soul who had been told to pass this message along to me. I'm not sure, was the response I got. <laughs> this is an error I'm asking to have fixed. This is not a claim, I told her. Then why are they calling it a claim, she asked me. I told her I had absolutely no idea. I explained my tale once again and insisted on speaking to another supervisor. Now, we were in July, and this had been going on since April. By that point, I was genuinely starting to despair of hope. I had done this I don't even know how many times. I was losing faith in the idea that anyone in that office would be capable of or interested in resolving this issue for me. There were thousands of dollars at stake at this point. And while I wasn't about to give up without a fight, I found myself completely stuck and uncertain of what to do next. So I did what any self-respecting 30-something in my day and age would do. I vented on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. And thank God I did. My persistence in this mess of a situation led to some actual friends who were willing to open their door and provide me with the comfort of a safe space and some wisdom. I received a smattering of different responses, many of whom had salient advice, many of which had salient advice of what to try next. I filed a formal complaint in their ombudsman department, then called the company again to let them know that not only had I filed said complaint, but that I was fully prepared to contact both the local news and hire an attorney in order to get the matter resolved. Wouldn't you believe it, folks? Within minutes, the <laughs> latest customer service representative, unfortunate enough to have me on the other end of the phone, got me in touch with not one, but three different supervisors who promised to look into the matter. And again, wonder of wonders, within 48 hours, the complaint department told me that the issue was fixed and I received the letter of confirmation that same week in Ask and it will be given to you. <laughs> Search and you will find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Persistence. I'm a pain in the neck sometimes. You all know this by now. But it does pay off sometimes. Even in the middle of the night when we are told no over and over again. When all hope seems lost. Persistence pays off. So what does this mean when we consider what Jesus is saying here about persistence in prayer? In the end, what is the purpose of prayer? Why, when Jesus is asked by his friends to teach him how to pray, does he not just give them pat words, but instead tries to explain what the essence of prayer really is? This is the context that Jesus is referring to here, and it sounds to our ears very strange, very topsy-turvy. Jesus is likening God to a slumbering neighbor who needs to be awakened by loud knocks and reminded of his responsibility to listen to our cries. I don't know about you, but this characterization of God is not the way I prefer to think about God. God is ever-present. Right? God is ever loving. God is always wishing to speak to us. In this story, though, we find God literally asleep on the job and not particularly excited about being awakened. That is not the normal image. Biblical scholar and theologian Cynthia Jarvis has a more nuanced take on it, and her perspective is among the most beautiful expositions on prayer that I've ever read. She writes this, each instruction Jesus gives the disciples invites them to enter into relationship. That relationship involves a conversation, and the conversation begins with a word. God has, spoken to the, has first spoken the one word to us 
in Jesus Christ. Now we need only muster the good sense to speak it back. If by God's grace we do, we will find ourselves literally in conversation with a friend who knows our every weakness because he himself has cried out in anguish and been met with silence. How else but in conversation with him through the words of scripture, the witness of his church, could we trust that God is a God who will come after us when we are lost, dine with us when we are cast out by all others, welcome us home after we have wasted our lives, and who will keep us from falling too far? How else but as God's Spirit, ours for the asking, intercedes between these words that bear witness to God in our poor, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short lives without Him? How else? will we find ourselves accompanied along the way. Beloved children of God, the art of prayer, the art of persistence, is this. It is rooted in relationship. If we look at the prayer Jesus gives the disciples, we see it beginning with praise and then leads into some very real asks for sustenance give us this day our daily bread, for forgiveness, but only as we forgive those who trespass against us, for deliverance from the very hardest of things. This is a gritty sort of accompaniment that Jesus is championing here in the Lord's Prayer. We are called to be persistent in that prayer, says Jesus, not in order to convince God exactly, but to remind ourselves and our communities of that deep love God has for us over and over and over and over again. And to remind each other of the deep level of accompaniment God wishes for us. Not every prayer will be answered to our liking, but the door will be opened to relationship. If not to a comforting answer, certainly to a journey of deepening faith, relationship, and self discovery. The Lord's Prayer is spoken in unison in our church and in every church I've ever been a part of. It's communal. It beckons us towards support for each other and encourages faithful, collective <coughs> persistence in faith. So when over a year later, after my lovely insurance woes, a friend of mine was having trouble with his insurance company covering an operation he needed. I encouraged him to persevere. I'm an educated white woman who had the added benefit of being a stay-at-home mother during that stretch five years ago. This meant that I could devote my time to being persistent in my fight with the system. But what of those who are far less privileged than I? who might need some encouragement and some friendship, some gritty accompaniment and persistence along the way. What about the poor black kid who ends up misunderstood and on the so-called wrong end of the law simply by virtue of the color of his skin? What about the lower class Latina woman who works 16 hour days and could never find the time during regular business hours to take her less than ethical landlord to court? My friends, those of us who are white have been given the benefit of the doubt in our culture. People of color are not. It is as simple as that. And I wonder, I wonder, what will change the hearts and souls of the people in this country who are so filled with hatred toward the other? What changes hearts and minds and souls? I'm convinced it's not rhetoric. It's not even sermons. It is relationship. It's relationship, it is persistence, it is love. For those of us who are in a position of privilege, I believe our call is to be persistent as friends and as allies, standing in solidarity with those whom society would rather quiet, allowing our voices to sometimes be quieter so that Others, which have been quieted for centuries, may now be amplified. And while that faded keystroke error could have happened in any company, 
It is no secret to folks who've worked in the field that the healthcare system is plagued with injustice, and the health insurance system even more so despite thousands of mostly well-intentioned people working therein. From this scripture passage, from these familiar words, Jesus' voice reverberates down to us today. Our call is to be a friend for others as Jesus is to us, and to be persistent in that relationship building, and persistent in prayer, persistent in action, and persistent in love, so that others can see the true message, which is a message from Christ of compassion and justice and hope for this world. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This was the way Jesus taught the disciples and us to pray, as a friend to all and with persistence. One other thing, too. Persistence in prayer reminds us that we are all God's beloved. We need that reminder, don't we? Persistence in friendship and solidarity, in opening the doors of our own hearts to hear of our belovedness, so that when we knock, we are reminding ourselves that there is an all-loving creator behind that door. Beloved of God, may it be so. May we endeavor to journey in such a way where we approach our God persistently, faithfully, consistently, in relationship, both with God and with each other. In the name of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit.